Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, first digital session of uh, 2022. My name is Marnik. I'm a project manager at uh, Close the Gap, and um, I'll be your host for uh, today, together with uh, my colleague Philippine. Philippine, you mind uh, <laughs> waving and saying hi? <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Philippine de Bruyne, and I work as communication officer, digital for development at Enable. And um, yeah, we are really glad to welcome you to this afternoon and to new session about um, this uh, passionate uh, topic of uh, offline content and knowledge management. And um, I leave the floor to Marnik, who's our host um, this afternoon. Thanks, Philippine. Uh, so, Philippine already. Um... Uh, highlighted that the topic for today is offline content and knowledge management. I'm pretty sure that's uh, the reason why many of you joined today. Um, we uh, have actually started the, the initiative, um, the digital sessions last year, uh, together with um, Enable and um, at, at a later stage, we have it um, in, in light of the digital for development uh, program that there's a gap is running for Belgian Development Corporation. And our idea or our ambition is um, uh, plainly, you know, to, to inspire uh, people and to, you know, help um, anyone that is interested in digitalization and uh, implementing um, this in their, their projects and programs, because we believe it can be a really powerful enabler for, for more impact in our, our sector. So we're really happy to have you here um, today. Um, we have uh, three great speakers that will, uh, um, you know, share their expertise with us or a particular project um, on offline content and, and knowledge management. And uh, uh, we first uh, will have uh, Peter from um, Educomondo um, speaking for us. Then we'll have uh, David from Cola CP, and uh, finally Mui Chen from Libraries Without Borders. Um, important uh, to uh, note is that uh, we want to make this as participatory as possible. So we really invite you to uh, share questions through the chat or to raise your hand um, later on uh, when we go into the, um, the, the Q&A, which will be after the three presentations. We're going to try to keep the presentations rather short. Um, we'll, we'll definitely end the meeting or the, the webinar at, uh, at three. Um, and, you know, we're trying to, uh, to give you as much uh, uh, time as possible to um, you know ask specific questions and go into um, the, the presentations and, and the topic as such topic sorry as such um, how are we going to uh, to organize that well um, you are free to share questions to the chat and you can also raise your hand um, when uh, we go into the Q and A um, we will then give you the floor or ask you to unmute in case you want to ask your question you can go ahead and, and do so. Um, in case you don't feel comfortable, um, then I will just ask the question if you uh, post it through the chat, that's, that's fine as well. Uh, please be aware that we are um, recording the session um, to use it later or to, to, to share it later for people who uh, weren't um, able to follow it live. So sh you should be um, aware of that, of course. Um, maybe one more thing to add for me. I saw that uh, we have 20 nationalities uh, registered for the, the session, which is pretty cool. Um, so I, I really hope everyone um, can bring in their own, you know, expertise or um, their own angle from their own, um, uh, you know, origin country. Um, and I think that uh, was about everything I had um, in mind to share with you before we dive into the first uh, uh, presentation. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, Peter, I will leave the floor to you then. Um, I'll stop sharing and you can... Uh, share your screen and address the audience as such. Go ahead. Okay, well, let me, uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction and uh, let me see if it works for sharing my screen. You're good to go, Peter. Is that a thumbs up? Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody, and also from my side, uh, you're welcome to this uh, series of uh, interesting topics. And uh, I'm going to focus on one particular area. I've translated the title Offline Content and Knowledge Management into a uh, learning management system, and really a full-fledged learning management system. Uh, because is it possible to actually have that offline? Is it possible to have that in a remote uh, area? And a little bit of a spoiler alert, the answer is yes. And uh, to do that, to arrive at that, 
Uh, I've split the presentation in two parts. The first part is more about our experience. What are the things to watch out for? And um, this is kind of translated into a the KISS principle. And I think you all know what the KISS principle is. We, we kind of expanded it a little bit. And then the second part is, how does, does it really look like? What do you need for such a full-fledged remote learning management system deployment? So uh, let's get started. Let's uh, get some kisses for the offline uh, system. So the first part or the first S within the KISS principle is keep it simple. I think we all know that. And it's very simple because, or it's very, I would say straightforward because we are working in a remote area with almost by definition, small locations, small schools, small classrooms with limited staff. And you cannot expect that these people are aware of very high-end networking or server management or anything like that. So you have to keep it as simple as possible and yet provide as much as possible functionality that is actually up to par to what uh, the capabilities are of the people. So the first thing is, you know, make it as simple as possible. And what I've noticed is that when we believe it is simple, I would say think again, because it's probably not simple enough. The second part is standard. Um, it's very tempting to go towards cheaper elements, cheaper hardware, or some very nice looking software. But if it's not standard, probably even globally, you will get in trouble on in the long run. So make it as standardized as possible. Use brands that are globally established. Then you will, you know, you will not run into issues rather than you know go for some cheaper options. And, and we all know that money and funding is always at a premium. Still, um, I would definitely recommend to go towards standard uh, topics. The, the next is make it sustainable and sustainable goes hand in hand with simple because the idea is that the people in that remote school can work with the system on their own without too much handholding or without any handholding at all. So it has to be sustainable. It has to be, um, it has to be carried by the local people who can actually add to it, who can use it, who can expand it uh, so that they don't always need help from, uh, from the outside world. The next one is scalable. And scalable is, I think, a very important element. Um, and the reason is that sooner or later, and in certain parts it's going to be more later, there will be an internet connection globally available in whatever part of the world. And you have to be ready. And even if today you have a very small installation, very localized, not connected, whatever you do, we always recommend to think ahead and to think cloud. And maybe that's five years, maybe even longer away, but it's important that it has to be scalable so that you can scale it from, from, once, from one classroom to maybe three classrooms, to five, to a, a school community, and later on into the cloud so that it's cloud ready. It has to be supported, that's the next S. And supported is not so much about the IT support that you should get from a local IT partner who is going to play a very important role, but it is supported by, I would say, three main um, people and, and or, or parts of your organization. The first one is your is the the school management. Uh, they have to support the uh, the project. The teachers have to support it and be behind it. And actually also the students have to be behind it because if those three don't like the system or don't want to work with it, then I can guarantee you it's going to end up on a shelf and it's going to gather dust like many of these projects that happened in the past. And then the last S is secure. And you might wonder why is security or IT security so important in an offline uh, organization or an offline deployment? Well, first of all, um, quite honestly, 100% offline is going to be very, very difficult. It is doable for a certain period of time. 
But after a while, I would certainly recommend people to go and uh, you take the installation and you will see that it's based around actually a laptop. And so mobility is really one of our key design principles that you can take that laptop uh, towards a place where there is an internet connection that can be an ad hoc 4G uh, internet connection via a dongle, but get the latest update of the different components. Uh, that's relatively easy to do, but it also is in view of the scalability and the future proofness of such a system that you actually embed a sound security management in your system. So these were, I think, from all the questions and, and the, uh, the, the, the comments that I get from remote installations are a little bit the key learnings that you have to look into and the key principles. So in the next slide, so how does it now really look like? So what are the different components of such a remote learning management system? And as you can see, it's, um, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, on the right side, you can see it, how, how it's run. So it's just a couple of components. Um, as I said, off the shelf, standardized components. And the, uh, the core is actually a laptop that is turned into a server running XAMPP, which, is, um, which stands for cross-platform, the X. A is Apache, which is the server software. M is MariaDB, it's a database, and then you have PHP and Perl. But the latter ones you really don't have to worry about. Um, it's a one-click installation uh, that, you can, uh, that you can download. So in preparing this installation, uh, it's very easy to, to set it up on a, uh, on a laptop. Then you actually make the laptop a server, which is just two or three different actions that you have to do, and um, install Moodle. And it's, it's all done. So it's uh, actually a five-step process. <clears throat> Once you've got that, you can put it into a network. And as you can see, the network is, uh, uh, is a bit based on, on the situation where electricity comes at a premium, uh, which means that from time to time there will be electricity outages. But then people can still, students can still continue to work. That's why we opt for uh, the use of tablets. That's why we also opt for the use of a laptop as a, uh, um, as a server and, uh, and also installing an uninterruptible power supply, a UPS. Um, we also recommend the use of a network attached storage. Um, if your laptop is, um, has, has a decent internal memory, like a, a terabyte or so, you can work and start without the network attached storage. But um, for four terabytes, it probably will cost you around 350 euros, or maybe 500 euros. Uh, so that's not really the big, uh, the big cost. And it will help you, and it will make your system also more secure. Uh, you have a little router and a switch uh, to, uh, to manage the, uh, the, the network internally. And then you have the network, so the access points preferably in a mesh uh, network so that you don't have any management for multiple access points because then it will all be done uh, across those, uh, those access points. So as you can see, it's, it's fairly simple. And uh, just to give you an idea, because I can imagine that everybody is thinking, okay, how much does this now cost? Well, you have it, uh, the system as it stands here, probably less than um, or anything between four and 5,000 uh, euros. Uh, the most, in most uh, or the highest cost is actually the tablets that probably will cost around 100 to 150 euros. Uh, if you take uh, Android uh, Samsungs, it will cost you indeed around 3,000 euros for 25 of these, uh, these tablets. So that's really the most uh, or the biggest chunk of, uh, of the cost. And then, of course, depending on your budget, you can continue to add more and more of these, uh, yeah, these tablets. Um, the way that it is configured like this, um, our experience is that you can run easily up to 50, five, zero concurrent users. Of course, if they all start to download and stream video, that will probably be a different uh, story. But in a normal interaction with, uh, with Moodle, a normal uh, um, uh, school um, courses uh, and so on and so forth, 
you can easily run with, uh, with 50 students, which is in line with the small kind of remote uh, your schools that, uh, that you have. So that's a little bit uh, yeah, the setup of, uh, of how it works. Uh, as I said, Moodle, for those who do not uh, know Moodle, it is the de facto open source standard that actually will work from elementary school all the way to online universities. It's, it's really globally used, which uh, also means that there is a huge global community to help uh, your people out. Then um, my last slide is uh, not so much a uh, pro and con slide, but it's more of an awareness that, uh, you know, whatever you do, there will be, you know, certain restrictions that uh, you have to take care of. And I'm not going to go through all of these uh, elements, but I think one of the parts that I definitely want to, to, to share is that uh, we have opted for Moodle, although we know that it has quite a steep learning curve, but uh, in view of the simplicity, you can actually make it extremely simple to use for and the teachers and the students. So that's, uh, that's the good part of it. You can really strip it down to the bare minimum. And uh, one of the things that we have noticed is uh, to do that is that at least you should work with what we call a learning management system champion or a single point of contact who is going to be really you know, is most of the time it's a teacher who has a little bit more of a technical inclination and he or she is going to be then the, the focal point uh, you to do that. Um, and then the last part is really when using tablets. Uh, tablets are more vulnerable than a laptop. They are certainly more vulnerable than a fixed PC. So we recommend definitely to use protective covers, which are really very sturdy for children. And also because unfortunately um, they get easily stolen to make sure that you have a cabinet that is that it can be locked uh, but a local carpenter can easily make that for you know very very little money uh, and that it's really secure so that uh, people cannot um, cannot use it for their own purposes um, so I, I'm not you, you can have this uh, slide definitely as uh, as, as a further reference. And uh, but I wanted to share that with me, with you, and uh, and yeah, happy to turn it back to to you, Marnik. Thanks a lot, uh, Peter. That's uh, that was really really interesting indeed. Uh, we'll go into a couple of questions later, but uh, I will first give the floor to uh, to David from CoLACP, who will um, share his uh, expertise on uh, with us. David, yes, the floor thank you is very yours. much, Peter. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting presentation. It's actually actually also moving to my presentation as well. So we'll see Modu once again. My name is David once again, and I'm from Collier CP. I work with Collier CP as a project manager in training units. Uh, I just want to share my screen with you very quickly for you to see my presentation. So yep, we're good to go, uh, David. Right. Thank you very much. You can see my screen now. Yes. Right, good. Welcome everyone once again. Uh, just in a nutshell, Kuli CP is an acronym uh, for Europe, African, Caribbean, Pacific, and Liaising Committee. Uh, you know, Kuli CP is a, is a network of companies, professional organizations, and experts uh, committed to inclusive and sustainable agriculture in um, ACP countries. When I mean ACP, I'm referring to the African, Caribbean, and the Pacific group of states. So uh, operationally, we work through uh, you know, technical corporations uh, to support uh, sustainable and inclusive uh, development of private sector, and of course, ensure an enabling environment as well for the government, uh, what we call the competent authorities uh, in these 50 African, Caribbean, and Pacific uh, uh, group of states. Now, the interesting thing here is that you, going into this particular presentation, you see, uh, what we do and how, you know, how do we impact this community with our offline solution and of course, uh, an online solution as well. Now, very important at the core of all our activity is the training units. So, and the training units where we are actually actually work presently, you know, where we strengthen the value chains so in fruit and vegetable across uh, these, um, you know, these ACP countries, the 50 African, Caribbean, and the Pacific group of states. So. In a way, the support services moving from ensuring market access and leveraging impact. But how do we do what we do 
you know, the, this is very important. And this is the, the most important part of, of, the, of the work, uh, you know, that we do in Coliscipi. And of course, relevant again uh, into this particular uh, presentation. Now, I'm gonna just to show you this, to see the milestone for what we have done or what we are doing presently uh, coming from when Coliscipi was established in 1973 up to now. You can see that we have grown into a number of 1,200 uh, you know, experts, different training tools, developed training courses all over the year, around the year, and in different training teams, which, which are we uh, show to us. So we've been able to do all these, combining the, the online solution and of course the offline solution as well. So the interesting thing about this, uh, about what we do in CoolACP is that you, uh, which is the solution I'm gonna to show to you later, you see how we've been able to, to adapt our methodology to fit the, the local content, how the, 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 the national relays, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the experts, the trainers, you know, from the ACP countries, how we've been able to train them and then how they've been able to go again and train other people using our distinctive, um, you know, cascading approach. Now, I'm gonna show this to you. Now, this is how we propagate the gospel. Uh, I call it the gospel, the good news that we spread across to them using our cascading training system. How do we do this? So we develop these particular systems, a kind of a system of technical, um, you know, corporations and vocational training through a very, very, you know, defined cascading uh, of training of trainers, uh, you know, methodology, which highly coordinated by the centralized team and implemented by national experts and trainers throughout the ACP countries. This is key, and this is very important, and this is how we get the message across. The cascading approach, we train the trainers in these countries, and then they train, uh, you know, the, the, the members in our, in our, in our ecosystem, the, the, all the members in the countries, they go ahead and train the, the farmers, the, the producers, and, and then the companies. So we use them to do that and to adapt the content. So how have they been able to do that? So I will, I will get there uh, very shortly. Now, our system, just as what uh, Peter said, the de facto is model platform. So what we've been able to use is of course, based our training, of course, on the model platform. Now, our training is, is based on that. Op op the model platform itself is an open source. Open source in the sense that this, you, you, you can, anybody can use it, it's freely available. You can go over there, it depends on how you use it to get what you want. So in Colier CP, the training that we run uh, for our members, we, we divide them into two. We have the self-study learning modules. I will, show to, I will show to you, I will share my screens and you can see uh, what we have uh, on, our, on our training platform. These self-study courses or these learning modules, as I call them, is available. It's open source. You don't have to have any framework with Colier CP or any existing agreement with Colier CP before you can take those courses. So this, the courses are there for you to take them. So while you can take those course online, you can also take this course as well offline. I will show that to you. Now, for the second type of training that we run, and this training, we call it a collective training, or we call it, we call it kind of a group training. So we target to, you know, different, um, with this kind of models, we have, you know, this training are targeting homogeneous groups, or it could be heterogeneous group that are following a particular course in, in our thematic uh, training. So normally it's tutor led. So the tutor in those country also support uh, the participant or the trainee in those training to help them to get the best out of the training. So, and then of course we have um, our model apps. Now, let me explain how this training can be downloaded offline. It is very simple. We recognize and we know that, uh, you know, in the SCP countries, in the rural, very far rural, just like uh, what Peter said, it's very difficult to have access to internet. This is, this is a very big problem over there. But with the solution that we provide, you know, for, for the members that actually follow, or for, for anyone, participants coming or training, trying to study on our training platform, we accompany them with offline solution. So for example, for the self-study learning modules, if you join the, the, the training, I will share my, my screen very shortly and show you, if you join the training, 
Why you can follow the training online? You can also follow the training offline as well. You only need to download this com. You download this com, then you can follow the training directly on your local computer, right? And for the self-study courses as well, we have used uh, different ways to actually make this possible. I'll give you an example. One of the solutions we use for the uh, tutor-led training is to use H5P, make it interactive. You, you may not actually or uh, maybe familiar with that, but it's, it's a very simple tools. We call it the HTML5 package. It's, it's another way to design training in a more interactive way. And then we make Lumi for you to be able to download this particular H5P activities and follow them offline as well on your computer. So whether you have internet or you don't have internet, you will still have access to this particular uh, you know, content that you are studying on the platform. And doing this has given us a lot of um, you know, opportunity and of course make the training more available, more accessible to a wider audience. And with the module app, it combines the two. If you download the module apps, you only need to visit uh, you know, the training just once. The last training you visited will be there on the mode apps and you can follow it offline. So all the solutions, and we are not leaving our trainee to follow this just on their own. In different countries, in the 50 ACP countries, we have our experts and our trainers which keep growing. They also go into, this, into these companies to, to meet the producers, even into schools, even university will support them you know, how they can take you know, advantage of this kind of services. So why they can follow the training online, we still have our expert that we send to this company as well and to this uh, uh, community to support them on how they can use uh, some of the facilities that we have on our online platform. And this is just uh, one part of the of CP services, but offline, how to benefit from them is what I've just explained to you. I'm going to share my screen just one more, one more time to see to show you very quickly how our CoLACP platform actually look like. And I'll show you the offline solution that we have um, uh, just beside it. So that is just all of from there. Just give me one second and I will just quickly share this with you. And then I will stop sharing and then we can have uh, leave the floor for Mui Sheng. Let me just share this for you. And then you can have a look at what we have on our training platform. So. This is called ACP uh, training platform. Now you can see from here, we have, we run trainees. Uh, we have already ready made training on sustainable production and trade, on agricultural production and processing on environment, even in management and business. So in plant aid. So the beauty about all these training is this, they are in three different levels, introduction, advanced, and of course, uh, intermediate and advanced. Why you can follow them online? If you go into any training, it will also guide you as well, how you can follow the training offline. I'm gonna pick one of the training. Let me pick from Plant X. And I'm gonna go into one of the training. Uh, maybe I should go to one of them and I'll show you what, okay, let me just pick pest, uh, pest risk analysis. I will pick one of the training and I will show you. If you are following this training online, the advantage you have is this. Right here, you can see from here, Download the entire course of offline, direct on your computer. And then you can follow the training offline. So this service has already helped a lot of our participants, a lot of our trainees coming into our training and taking, you know, um, you know, taking the offline version of this training that benefit them. And beside that, we also have access to the other materials in the e-libraries, which they can only visit once. If they visit there once, they can download this material as well you know, on their computer. So they can have access to all this content offline. But don't forget, all you need to do is to look at the one that you're looking for. And since the self-study courses, they are just, they are there for you. They are, they are open source, free to, free to join. You can join uh, without any existing uh, contract with us. But if you need any help on how to assess the content, you know, offline, you can contact us. I, I will be able to support you and give you the you know access to the platform, which you can also have by yourself, and you can download the materials and follow your training offline. So, if you have any question, you can save it while we have a uh, uh, coming in uh, to to make a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, David. That was uh, really interesting, and uh, we'll go into uh, some of the 
the examples you gave uh, later during the, the Q&A. Wicheng, first we'll uh, have you uh, finally come to the floor. You can uh, start sharing your screen and then unmute and then I will shut up. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Moni. Thank you very much uh, for the previous talks who are laying the ground for and making the job much easier for me. Uh, let me go into slideshow mode. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Mu Cheng Pesh and I'm the Education Director at Libraries Without Borders. Very glad to be able to discuss all of that today with you. Um, perhaps just me, let me just tell you who we are before I start talking about offline uh, solutions. Uh, so Libraries Without Borders or Bibliotheques en Frontières is an international NGO that uh, strives to empower communities uh, through access uh, to education, uh, knowledge, uh, and information. We work today in more than uh, 30 countries, uh, very different contexts from uh, underprivileged neighborhoods in uh, high income countries such as France, the US, or Belgium, to um, low and middle income countries, to humanitarian crises, such as, for instance, uh, currently in Ukraine or in Bangladesh, uh, in the Great Lakes region in, uh, in Africa. Uh, we started working on offline, what we call offline internet, actually because we had to. Uh, we first started deploying solutions uh, in refugee camps uh, in Burundi and uh, started working with satellite internet to provide access to rich media content. Uh, but it soon turned out to be not a very sustainable solutions because uh, very early in the month, we didn't have enough data to provide access to uh, video and rich media content that require lots of bandwidth. And so that's when we started toying with uh, offline solutions. Um, and we, what we do is that I would say we design offline internet solutions uh, for humanitarian response, but also for development response in area with no or low access to the internet. Uh, and we try to address a triple challenge. First, the connectivity challenge by uh, creating innovative, frugal, and robust technologies that enable offline access to content uh, and that are adapted to uh, challenging conditions in terms of uh, temperature, in terms of humidity, dust, etc., but also in terms of um, ownership. Uh, the second challenge that we try to address, and I think that's uh, even more interesting than uh, the connectivity one, is the relevance of the content trying to uh, curate, localize, and easy to update content uh, in the relevant languages that and, and fitting the needs uh, of the local communities with whom we're working. Uh, and so that's really one of main focus as actually librarians, trying to uh, work together with the end users to identify uh, very precisely the content that they need and curate open access content that would really uh, respond, to that, respond to that need. And sometimes that also requires creating content locally with the communities. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting challenge um, as most of the content today created in the educational world actually comes from high income countries, uh, even those who are used in low or middle income countries. And so there's also this uh, unbalance that we're trying to, um, to address. And finally, but not the least uh, of the challenges is the ownership challenges. For us, it's really important to always work with local communities to build local capacity. The idea is not some, simply to drop technology, but really to work on solutions that will be fully integrated into the local ecosystem. And so building community of practice, um, doing in-person training of facilitators is really essential because technology will never replace human mediation, human facilitation. It's rather a tool, a lever that can amplify the impact uh, of field actors. So for us, it's all about connectivity, but also content uh, and ownership. Um, and perhaps you know of this index called the Inclusive Internet Index. It's quite interesting because for once, uh, it does not only focuses <coughs> on access and accessibility, but also on the relevance of content and the preparedness of the populations. And so that's really this sort of holistic approach that we're trying to have here. <coughs> so what we do is that we work uh, on solutions that really uh, are designed to fit the needs of the population first, the need of humanitarian or development actors and the field realities as well. Uh, and let me just tell you quickly about uh, two of the of the tools that we've been uh, working on, and in particular in our partnership with uh, Enable. Um, 
So the first one is the one that you see over here, which is called the Ideas Cube. And it resembles a lot the, the solutions that uh, my colleagues have uh, highlighted just before. Uh, and as uh, they, they insisted, it's really um, not, I, I think it's less about the channel and the tool per se than actually the methodology. So the Ideas Cube is another um, technology that enables offline access to content. It's basically a small nano server that creates a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, and that allows uh, end users to browse local apps and content as if they were on the internet, except that they're actually on the local network. Um, this one is a, a, a version that we've been working on for the last few years, uh, but we also have developed a new version just recently based on the Raspberry Pi uh, computer which is completely open source uh, and that can be built uh, locally in Fab Labs or simply uh, by the end users themselves. Uh, and so the idea is to be able to um, equip um, collective centers, community centers, youth centers, health centers, schools, etc., with these sorts of devices uh, that allows a collective use. The one below is uh, quite interesting as well because it targeted uh, it targets actually uh, the end users at the individual level. It's called Kaju and it's uh, a micro SD card. The same things that you would insert into your smartphones or your cameras to increase the storage. Uh, and this micro SD card transforms your smartphone into a content, a digital content library, or uh, a small offline digital compass. It's, uh, it contains an Android app that would emulate a website or um, learning management system on your smartphone, allowing you to have access to high um, resolution rich media without actually consuming any data. And what's also interesting is that Kaju allows uh, interactions with the end users by sending them notification and surveys, uh, when, even when uh, they're offline using um, SMS uh, technology actually, or connectivity whenever they have it. Uh, because when we say that 50% of the world population doesn't have access to the internet, it's actually a mixture of people who do not at all have access to any connectivity, about 20% of them, and 30% of them who have access to um, some connectivity, but in an intermittent way or with a very low bandwidth. Um, perhaps I, I just wanted to highlight a few of the use cases uh, of uh, this type of solution for us. We have been working with uh, numerous partners, among which Inabel, but also uh, the UNHCR, UNICEF, Save the Children, etc., in different sectors. Of course, education, providing access to uh, digital resources to enhance the quality of education uh, in contexts that are offline. Uh, and so it's all about how technology can be leveraged for the teachers to address uh, each, children, each child's, its pupils' uh, individual progress, how to enable them so to, to have access to self-paced learning, how to really position the teacher as a facilitator and someone who can focus on individualized ped pedagogy rather than um, just uh, doing magical courses. Uh, we also have some interesting use cases in terms of um, health, uh, in, in terms of um, sexual and reproductive health, of course, but also uh, feminine, maternal, infantile uh, health questions by providing health centers with uh, servers that would enable people to access prevention uh, information even wh while they're waiting actually for their appointment. We also had an interesting use cases during the pandemic where we used the network of servers to quickly disseminate uh, crucial information about the COVID-19 response uh, in terms of sensitization, but also fighting fake news. Um, and in Bangladesh, we have some interesting use cases uh, in this sector called communication with communities. That is to say, how can we, uh, with the communities, uh, relay, uh, build messaging and relay messaging that is reliable, that is locally uh, adapted to the context uh, in order to facilitate communication between uh, the humanitarian actors and the local communities. So here are a few examples. Uh, this, once again, these are technologies, content, and uh, methodologies that are completely open source. Uh, and our goal here is rather to find partners with whom we can collaborate, mutualize uh, the tools, the resources, the documentation that we have uh, so that we can together have uh, a bigger impact. 
I'm going to stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.